Good morning to you this morning. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Looking forward to uh, our worship time together today. Uh, I've got uh, an announcement I want to make and a couple of announcements and then our, our prayer list for today. Uh, I have a little thank you note from a Southern uh, Care Hospice for the pound cakes that were made uh, back when we do our ladies did those. So, so thankful for that. And I'll put that uh, note back in the back so that you can see that. Uh, also, next Sunday, uh, July uh, 1st, uh, be our, our Brotherhood uh, Breakfast. So just a reminder about that. July the 3rd, uh, the, uh, that should be the 7th though, right? Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I could feel Tom Salo saying that wasn't right. Can y'all believe that? I could just feel it. And then uh, he's, uh-uh. <laughs> I, I, I could just feel it. The 7th, July the 7th. Uh, that's next Sunday, uh, our Brotherhood Breakfast. And then uh, July 3rd, uh, the craft class from 10 to 1. So just a reminder uh, about uh, those things. Uh, our, our prayer list for today, uh, Luther has a, a friend uh, who passed away unexpectedly, uh, Wayne Dawson, a close friend of his, uh, and that uh, funeral service is uh, upcoming uh, this week. So just especially remember uh, family in your prayers uh, at Mex be it in Mexi Baptist Church uh, on the uh, on Wednesday uh, the third. So especially uh, keep Wayne Dawson's family uh, in your prayers. And then I want to go down uh, our our uh, prayer list for today. Uh, Felix Andrews, Anna Arrington, Rhonda Baggett, Dwight Bennett, Hiram Beasley, Robbie Lyles, Kim Brown, Max Bush. Walter Carrier, Wayne Carrier, and Wayne uh, made it home this week uh, at the end of the week, so we're thankful for that. I ask you to continue to remember uh, him and, and Janine uh, in your prayers. Uh, Tommy Kendrick, uh, Evan L. Hawford, Berlin Finley, John Andrews, Cheryl Johnston, uh, Cecilia McCullough, Steve Moon, Brenda Creech, Sheila Brown, uh, Patricia McCullough, Judy Anderson, Jimmy Cook, Jackie Skipper, Becky Smith, Laura Joyner, Verley Stuckey, Daryl Levi, Fred McIntyre, Bessie Watts, John Woodward, uh, Janice Vickery, Randy Higdon, Thomas Fowler, Brenda Wilson, Hank Long, Jimmy and Janice Booker, Francis Shadburn, Dot Campbell, and uh, Dot's report came back and that Cancer had spread uh, further than they had anticipated, so she is awaiting uh, a uh, visit to the doctor in UAB. So uh, just especially continue to remember Dodd and her family uh, in your prayers. Melissa Robinson, uh, Larry Smith, Gail Armstrong, Bill Bender, Carolyn Leonard, Ralph Deason, Lorenzo Calvin, Frank Williams, Jerry New, Brenda Welch, Vince Heath, James McClammy, Mary Johnson, Ava Anderson, Rex Shows, Barry Hall, Maury Coven, and she got home this week, so we're grateful for that, thankful for that, continue to remember her in prayer. Uh, Mary Brown, Clifford and Versa Higdon, uh, Bobby Johnson, Jesse Hagburn, Bill Coker, Jerry Chandler, Robert Smith, Van Sims, Rebecca Gorham, uh, Clinton Morris, uh, Joyce Bradley, Darlene Campbell, Richard Leota, uh, Jim McKinney, uh, Mary Frances Vickery, uh, Betty Maxwell, Ashley Phillips, Joni Salter, Maxine Williams, Doris Knight. Miss Doris had surgery this week and has had a sort of a hard week, but doing better, so we're thankful for that. Continue to remember Miss Doris in your prayers. Uh, David Clark, Taylor Crawley, Donnie Waters, Valerie Smith, Sheila Adams, we can take off the prayer list, uh, Jessica Spears, Sarah Tolan, Betty Brantley, Nina Fisher. Uh, Nina ran into some issues this week. She has blood clots in the legs and her lungs. And so just especially remember her. They're doing some things. She's responding to uh, medication uh, to, to, to dissolve those, but just especially remember her in your prayers. She's in the hospital in Montgomery. Buggy Weaver, uh, Lance Stringer, Bonnie Brown, Amanda Armstrong, Cindy Crosby, Eddie Braxton, 
uh, Aaron Odom, uh, Mallory Holder, Deborah Hoddard, Pete Hicks, Randy Williams, William Cater, Betty Booker, and Miss Betty is a little better today. It's been a hard week for her. And she had a trip back to Mobile, but is, is a little better this morning, so we're grateful for that. She texted uh, Peggy and I this morning, so we're thankful for that. She said she had her outline, she was ready to go this morning. Bless her heart. And somewhere during this rough week, she went back and called up from last Sunday. I, I, they're, they're amazed, and I appreciate her, Mr. Conrad. Uh, Denise Deason, uh, Dwight Taylor, his surgery was postponed and is scheduled for August the 15th. So just a reminder about that. Jimmy and Mildred Conway, uh, especially continue to remember them. Bobby uh, Armstrong, uh, Kathy Robinson. We got a clear report. So she's got a praise right there. So we're thankful to the good Lord for that, for those answered prayers. And uh, so, so thankful. Uh, Kathy Campbell, we want to add her to the prayer list. Kathy has uh, shingles as much as all that she's gone through, and she, she's got a pretty bad case of those. So just especially remember, uh, Kathy, uh, in your prayers. If you would, open your Bibles today to the book of Revelation, chapter 9. Revelation, the ninth chapter. Now we're going to leave our 4th of July display up uh, till next week. I'm going to bring a message from one of my favorite, I think it's probably, if I had to say, my favorite psalm out of all the 150 of them, Psalm 126, is my favorite psalm. And I'm going to preach from that next Sunday in a message that I've entitled, Snapshots of America. And I believe that there are some snapshots in that psalm that we'll see next week. So I hope you'll invite people to come join us next Sunday as we talk about uh, snapshots of America. But today we're going to continue our study in the book of Revelation. And I want to just read uh, two verses this morning. We'll go through this entire chapter in the message in a little bit. But let me just read uh, Revelation 9 verses 20 through 21. The Bible says, But the rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, nor hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, or the sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. You know, aren't you glad today that we have a God who does here. Amen? You, you notice here's a group of people who are bowing down to one who cannot hear. He cannot walk. He cannot do you any good. And yet they're bowing down to Him. We have an opportunity today to bow to a God who can hear, who can move, and who can help us. And you know, I just want to share this little tidbit of, I think, inspiration with you before I pray. This morning at 11 o'clock at the end of the service in Greenville, I'm going to baptize two people, uh, one a teenager and one, uh, one of our children. A few weeks ago, he came down the aisle and gave his life to Christ. His mom and daddy were kind of wanting to kind of hold on to him a little bit, but, but he broke loose. And he came down, and I won't ever, out of all of the conversions of children that I've ever experienced, I won't ever forget this. You remember a few weeks ago, I made this statement when we were talking about our study of Revelation, about people saying to me, well, you know, I'll just wait till then. If a great multitude is going to get saved, I'll wait till then, and maybe I'll make that decision then. And you remember, I made this statement in that message that day. Why would you think that you will make a decision when it's hard when you won't make a decision today when it's easy? Remember? That little fella came down and looked me in the face and he said, Brother Herbert, I want to make it while it's easy. Isn't that something? A child now. I, so don't tell me they don't listen out there now. They may fumble around and not make you think they're not listening. I learned a long time ago my kids could be playing around in the floor and I'd mention their name in church. They'd perk up and you'd see that head come up over the pew. You know what I'm saying? 
they, 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 they can do what I can't, and that's two things at one time. I got, to, I got to do only one thing at the time. Well, let me pray, all right? I'm ready to preach today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the good day that you've provided for us. I know, Lord, it's warm, but Father, you've provided the day, and, 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 and Lord, you in control of it all. And I'm grateful, Lord, that it is in your hands and not our hands. And I'm grateful that, Lord, in spite of what we think or even what we feel, you love us, you care for us, and you provide for us. And I thank you for that. And Lord, I thank you this morning that you've moved and worked on behalf of people on our prayer list. I know there's a way, Lord, uh, to go for many of these that are on our list. But God, you've given slight improvement and we're grateful for that. And we pray for continued improvement for health on these that are on our prayer list that we lift up to you. We pray for those who have reports that have come back that haven't been uh, what we had prayed for or even what we'd hoped for. And we pray that you give guidance and direction to them and provide care for them and, and provide them uh, people with the skills and abilities to be able to help them with their physical needs. Father, again, I just thank you for the privilege of worship. I thank you for our country and I ask your blessings upon it today. Lord, bless us as a nation to return to the truths of your word and to return to the holding of those truths dear to our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. So we're going to be praying for our nation in a moment. But first what I wanted to do on behalf of the ladies, Miss Marjorie's Sunday school class and our Sunday school class, the men, the ladies, they meet back there with the coffee, and if men want coffee, they got to ask the ladies if they can have a cup. That's but that's right. That's right. That, they got something to say too. And, and but but we understand and feel strongly that you know God's going to grow His church from within, and you know I've told the preacher many times in a deacon meeting that, you know, good thing about Olive Branch Baptist Church, we have a real good preacher. The bad thing, he's too good of a preacher, and we're ready to just go on home when he gets through. We want to meet together, and I just need to tell a little short story about my own personal life. Years ago, before God showed enough turned me around, I mean around, yeah, I didn't want to go to Sunday school. I was scared I might have to read out loud or be called on to pray. Well, we don't have that kind of pressure on people. It's all volunteer. You can just listen to us few stumble and mumble through it. But we like to discuss the carrying on of the word outside those doors. That's what we're supposed to do once we hear the sermon, right, is go live it in our everyday lives. Well, that's what we do. We discuss that. And we use, the men usually piggyback off what the preacher just preached about. I seldom get to the literature uh, because the preaching is so good and we just discuss that further scripturally. But we want to make sure you feel welcome to come. You're not coming to listen to perfect people talk about it. You're just people like y'all that have shortcomings and failures and need forgiveness. But... I want to read this, to, this, in, this introduction to our lesson today. I'd like to read it, and I'm so thankful for you all long-suffering and patience and the preacher giving it his time. But we might need a little bit of this before we get hit with them two other trumpets because right. it's fixing to be rough. Praying for our nation. It said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know, meekness doesn't mean weakness because we can't be weak and stand for the Word of God, proclaim the Word of God, guard the Word of God, and fight for the Word of God and be meek. Not, I mean, we can't be weak. We have to be meek. We have to be kind and loving. But we have to be strong. And these Sunday school classes will help grow that strength. I promise you. It has in my life. And I thank God for it. Humil humility is an attribute of Christ. And this is an attribute that he wants us to have. But for many believers, acquiring that humility is not real easy. We, have, we live a life 
in a world that is controlled by a strong attitude of pride where the ambitions of many people are to take what they want without regards to others. This is the world's definition of inherit the earth. It's wrong. But it's not what Jesus meant. This prideful culture attitude is driven by a me generation of people that looks out for themselves. Unfortunately, this attitude sometimes seeps into the church and into the lives of Christians. That's, that's why we have to beware lest we fall. The, the upside down prideful attitude of the world has no place in our hearts and our lives. In this lesson this week through King Solomon, God gives the same message to the Israelites. Prideful attitudes had caused them to choose a waywardness of the world. This led to suffering and distress, don't it? Don't it? Yes. God resolved, God's resolution was for the people to return to him in repentance and humility so that he could extend his blessing. This is the lesson that we can learn to do too. May we pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so grateful and so humbled by your grace and your mercy that you have upon us. We have before us today this cross that has a flag draped over it, that has a Bible on it, that has the eagles on it, has these beautiful flowers of your creation by it as a decoration. All these things are from you. And Father, if it wasn't for the cross, we wouldn't have anything to hang the flag on. And if it wasn't for the Bible, the deed of this earth, you say that this earth is yours and everything in it. Father, I never have bought a piece of land, never acquired a piece of land that the title search went back to your deed. And it's all yours. We're here to, to proclaim that it's all yours. Submit that kind of attitude and humility that everything we have is yours, Father. Now, when we go forward in this service, we need to go forward with the attitude that this is your world and we're living in it. But Father, we want to take time to pray for this nation, for the leaders of this nation. Father, it doesn't look like, you know, we've heard it said that we don't, we don't see a lot of difference between the world and the church anymore. Well, we can make that difference in this part of this church. We can let people of this community and this county see the difference inside this church. And Father, they're supposed to be able to tell the difference. And Father, when it comes to the leaders of this nation, we pray for them. We pray that you turn the hearts. And we got to realize that we're the voters and we need to be led by the Holy Spirit of God and who we're to vote for. I'm not here to claim either party, any party, but I'm here to claim Jesus Christ and it's only through him that this country can be turned back again. There never would have been a country had it, would, had it not been for Christ. And it's been existing almost 250 years. That's just a little bit of time for God. Now let's spend the rest of the time that he blesses us with on this earth to live for him, stand for him, and proclaim his word. Now we come to this time of this service to give back what's already yours. May we do it with a cheerful heart and remembering where all of our blessings come from. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, it's, it's not my age that makes me have to have help. It's vertigo. <laughs> and that just comes at any age, right? I hope this blesses you this morning. Stands a lady with 
her torch up to the sky and all who see her know she stands for liberty for you and me I'm so glad to be called an American to be part of the run and the free on a shame I'll honor the flag and in God we trust and the statue of liberty on Cross with my Lord held to the sky, and all who kneel there live forever. All redeemed in Jesus Christ. I'm so glad to be called a Christian, to be part of the So the cross liberates the soul, and the cross is my statue of liberty. It was there that my soul was made free on a shame thou proclaim that old rugged cross as my statue of liberty If you would open your Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation, the ninth chapter today. Uh, we're going to look at all of the verses, uh, 21 uh, verses of this chapter today as we uh, walk down through uh, this chapter. Uh, and I want to speak to you uh, today as we uh, look at uh, this particular chapter uh, about uh, an event that is going to come as we see these trumpets continue to be blown. And the title is A World Gone Wild. A World Gone Wild. That's the reason I selected the last two verses of this chapter to read a few moments ago in our scripture reading. In those two verses you see the result of a world that is absolutely run from God. We have symbols on our uh, table this morning that are symbols of this nation. Our flag is a symbol of our nation. The cross is a symbol of uh, uh, us as a Christian people. And of course, the Word of God, the principles upon which you and I stand, 
and the, and the truth above which you and I receive the cross and the message of forgiveness. All these are symbols that represent something special to us as Christians and also as Americans. And sad indeed it is when a culture or a people reach a point where they reject these kinds of symbols. And we're going to see as we study this chapter today that a world is coming that will literally run wild away from God. Now when you look at our world, you can begin to see how that could happen, can't you? Because already in America, we are a world that runs away from the things of God rather than running toward the things of God. In America today, as we celebrate our nation's birthday, we, we, are, we are saddened in many ways at the things that we see when people had rather hold the philosophies of mankind rather than hold to the truths of the Word of God. And so I want to talk to you a little bit today as we continue our series in the book of Revelation about a world that is gone wild. As we study this chapter, it is quite a sordid chapter. It really is. It's a chapter really that is somewhat depressing. These chapters really are not really exciting chapters to have to wade through. They are chapters of judgment and punishment that one of these days is going to come upon the world. And as I've studied these, this chapter and as I've studied all these chapters from week to week with you, I'm always asking God, God, give me the practical insight and the practical application for us today. I know these are warnings for us. In fact, just remember that all this is really a warning. It's God warning us as a culture. God warning us as a world that one of these days judgment is going to come that one of these days evil is going to be punished. It's not going to get away with what it's doing. Satan isn't going to get away with it. Neither are sinners going to get away with it. And these chapters warn us. But I want to remind you this morning, and God just sort of tugged at my heart this week as I was reading this chapter and reminded me of this. Sometimes as we wade through these chapters of judgment, if we aren't careful, we'll forget that this book right here carries a blessing. Remember? This book has a blessing attached to it. In fact, this is one of the few books in the Bible that literally it says, if you read it, if you hear it, and if you keep it, that you'll be blessed. Remember that? Back in Revelation chapter 1, uh, you remember that third verse it says, if we, if we read it, we'll be blessed. If we hear it, we'll be blessed. If we keep it, we'll be blessed. And then as the book closes in chapter 22 and verse 8, it says again, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy. So just remember that th though this book is a book of judgment and has a lot of chapters that deal with God's judgment on sin, it is a book of blessing. But only if you saved. Only if you saved. Only if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This book is not a book of blessing. If you're lost, it's a book of burden. Because this book tells what one of these days is going to happen to those who do not know Jesus Christ and who go through this period of time that the Bible calls great tribulation. Now I want to remind you again of another thought that was a blessing to me uh, as I studied this chapter this week. And that is, remember what I told you at the beginning? That this book is a revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. The very first verse of this book says it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And when you study the book of Revelation, Jesus is shown to us in this book not only as the Savior of the world, but as the Sovereign of the world. As the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I don't know about you, but it thrills my heart it excites my soul to know that one of these days evil will be put down, the devil will ultimately be cast into a lake of fire, and Jesus Christ will ultimately be the victor. It absolutely thrills my soul. Listen, I want to tell you, if you have chosen this world, you've chosen the wrong world. And if you have decided that you are going to side with the devil and follow the things of the devil, you're following the loser this morning, ladies and gentlemen. I just want you to know, you're following the loser. I'm telling you, he is defeated already. His doom has been set. He is, he is sailing a sinking ship, and Jesus Christ is the victor, our King of kings and Lord of lords. 
And so the book is a blessing. And it does point us to the one who is ultimately in control and will one day rapture and rescue his people out of this world and pour out his judgment upon unrepentant and rejecting people. And so let's walk through the chapter this morning. I want to show you a world gone wild. Remember, we're in some of these sevens. I, I put this in your outline, I believe, for you this week. We have a series of sevens. I mentioned them last uh, Sunday. I want to mention them again, and I want to show you something interesting about them. This series of sevens give us a picture of very interesting things. Number one, the, the seven seals give us a picture of a world ruined by sin and man. That's what you see in those opening seals, a world that has been ruined by sin and man, and as a result of that, God is judging the world. And then when you come to the seven trumpets, they give us a picture of a world run by Satan. Hey, how would you like to live in a world totally run by the devil? Hmm? You, you might think that it's bad now, and it is. You might think that it's rough now, and it is. I had a funeral service for uh, a deacon for many years at Southside. And uh, he had a saying, if it can get worse, it will. And I want to tell you, if it can get worse, it will. And it's not only will, it's going to get worse. And that time called Great Tribulation is going to be a horrible time on this earth. And we're going to see that in just a little bit. And the reason is, it's going to be a world totally run for a period of seven years by the devil himself. And we'll walk through those, that time in a moment. And then we've got the seven bowls. And those bowls give us a picture of a world that one of these days will be reclaimed by the Lord Jesus Christ in final judgment that comes upon the earth that will end in the Lord coming back and the battle of Armageddon and a millennial thousand year reign on the earth. Let's look though at this world that is gone wild. I want to give you the practical application for this message today. I want to mention it now. I'll mention it right at the end of the message this morning after we have walked through these verses. But here's what God taught me, and I'd never thought about it, and I've studied this chapter several times. Here's the practical application that God gave me this week. And I, I, it's the key thought for this message, and here it is. Repentance is a gift from God and is not to be taken for granted. I just want you to think about it. Repentance is a gift from God. Did you know that? Did you know that the very ability to repent of sin is a gift from God. I want you to turn for just a moment before we dig into this chapter to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy, the second chapter. And I want to show you what Paul, in talking to young Timothy, what Paul said to him in verse 25 and 26. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25, Paul said, giving some instruction to Timothy, he said, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. Listen to what he said. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. You notice it? If God perhaps will do what? Will grant them repentance. Repentance is a gift from God and is not to be taken for granted. And let me tell you why. And I'll emphasize it right at the end before I give invitation this morning. Because here's why. A group of people are going to reach such a period in their life that they will no longer want to repent. That's the danger this morning, ladies and gentlemen. That you can have the opportunity to repent, but if you can so reject that opportunity, so prolong that opportunity, that your heart becomes hard, and you don't even want to repent anymore. And we'll see a culture that becomes exactly that way. Three things I want you to notice as we walk down through these verses this morning, and they are quite some verses. The first thing I want you to notice down through about the first 11 verses is what I'm calling the fallen angels. The fallen angels. I want you to notice in verse 1 he says, Then the fifth angel sounded, 
And I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Now let's pause for a moment and let's look at this star. I circled the word star in my Bible. Here in this passage of Scripture, the fifth trumpet sounds, and in the sounding of that trumpet, a star falls out of heaven. So the obvious question is, well, what's the identity of the star? Who is the star? What is the star? You say, preacher, is it a, is it a literal star falling out of heaven? I don't think so. I think it is a picture of something. In fact, I think the star is not a something. I think the star is a someone. And you say, well, who do you think it is? I think it is none other than Satan himself. No, no, notice the language. See, this star is not referred... It, it, the, the, the Bible uses pronouns to refer to the star. Notice in verse 1, when the angel, uh, the, the trumpet sounded, says, I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth, and to what? To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Verse 2, and what? He opened the bottomless pit. So in reference to the star, it's not a it, it's a someone. And so I think we have a reference here. I believe we have a reference here to the, to the devil himself. The Bible called uh, the devil various names. In fact, Jesus in chapter 10 and verse 18 said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's what Jesus said. Well, what does that sound like? That sounds like a star coming out of the heaven, does it not? And, Re uh, and Isaiah chapter 14 gives you a vivid description. I won't turn to it this morning, but gives you a vivid descripture, description of Lucifer as he falls out of heaven. In fact, there's an interesting word used in this text in verse 1 when he says, And I saw a star, notice the word, fallen from heaven. And the tense in the Greek carries the idea that it's already happened. That what John is seeing is a fall that has already occurred. And so the personality of the star, it is Satan himself. That's why I tell you that this period of time will be a world run by the devil himself. Here is Satan, and for a period of time he is in control. The identity of the star is Satan himself. And then I want you to notice the invasion from the smoke. The invasion from the smoke. Because the Bible teaches us in verse 3 and following that there's going to be an invasion coming from the smoke, coming from the bottomless pit. You'll notice that it, it talks about this bottomless pit in verse 1. And you'll notice that it says to this star a key was given. You notice that? A key was given to it. He didn't have the key, but a key was given to it. Where did he get the key? I can tell you where he got the key. He got it from the Lord Jesus. That's where he got the key. You know why I know that? I know that because Revelation 1.17 says, Jesus said, I'm Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and the last. And I have the keys of Hades, that's hell, and death. He's the one that's got the keys. <clears throat> and so the Lord Jesus presents him with the keys to the bottomless pit. And you can read these references, Jude verse 6 and 2 Peter 2, 4 talks about angels that have been chained in utter darkness. One of these days, a key is going to be given and angels like you could not even begin to imagine are going to be turned loose on the earth. The, the Bible says, John saw it in verse 3 when he said, Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth. Are they real locusts? I don't believe they are. I believe they're a picture again. And, and let me give you the reasons why. Notice what he says they're not going to do. Notice he says they were commanded, don't harm the grass of the earth, the green thing or the tree, but only men. Now, what do locusts do? That's what they do. They eat the tree. They eat the green thing. But no, that's not what these locusts are going to do. But the real clincher for me is down in verse number 11 where it says, and they had a king over them. See that? These locusts had a king over them. Now guess what the Bible says in Proverbs 30 in verse 27. It says that the locusts have no king, yet they move in rank. That's what the proverb writer said. 
So I don't think we have literal locusts here. I think what you have is an invasion from the pits of hell itself pouring out upon this world. And we have a world that is then going to be run by Satan himself. So you've got fallen angels. Man, I, I, I'm glad I'm saved this morning. If I wasn't saved, I'd want to be saved. Amen? If I wasn't saved, I'd want to get saved so I could get raptured and I wouldn't have to worry about these seven years of tribulation on the earth. And so you see the fallen angels. And then the second thing I want you to notice, beginning with verse 13 and going all the way down to verse 19, is the fearful army. Notice this fearful army that John saw that he begins to talk about when the sixth angel sounded and the trumpet blows in verse 13 it says, And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which are before God. The four horns of the golden altar. The altar was the place of sacrifice. The altar was the place of two things, salvation and judgment. You see, whenever there was a sacrifice in the Old Testament, the sacrifice was made by something or someone for the purpose of salvation. Blood was shed so that forgiveness could come. But you see, the altar was for salvation, but also for judgment. Because in order for there to be forgiveness, blood had to be shed, which meant a sacrifice had to be made. Something had to be judged. When you see this altar in heaven, it's not a place of salvation it's a place of judgment. And angels are about to be released from the uh, place of the river Euphrates that I'm going to talk about in just a moment. So there are three things quickly that I want you to notice about this fearful army that one day is going to come upon the earth. I want you to notice, first of all, the demonic commanders. Notice those who are going to command and lead this army. The Bible tells us in verse uh, uh, 15, so the four angels who had been prepared, and notice, they were prepared for what? For the hour, for the day, for the month, and for the year. They were prepared to be released to kill a third of mankind. Already a fourth of mankind has been killed. Now a third is about to lose its life. So we're talking billions of people, folks. Billions of people who during this period of time are going to lose their life. Just, by, just because they're living during this time, they're going to lose their life. We've already talked about those who profess faith during this time will lose their life, except for 144,000. They've been sealed by God, and nothing is going to happen to them. And so you see these four angels, they're the commanders of this army. And they're going to kill billions of people. And you say, well, well, well how are they going to accomplish that task? Well, we know that one angel of God in the Old Testament killed 185,000 in a night. We know that. And here are four angels, but look, they are not by themselves. Not only do you notice the demonic commanders, but notice the diabolical crusaders. They, they have an army, as you continue to read, in verse 16, the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And he goes on in these verses to describe uh, the horses and, and the hoofbeats uh, as uh, this army comes upon the scene. Do, do, do you say, preacher, is, is it a literal army or a demonic army? I believe it's a little army, but I believe it's controlled and empowered by the devil himself. Listen, I believe much of what we're seeing in many arenas in America, has something very sinister behind it. Something very sinister behind it. I'm telling you, many of the movements, and I could begin to describe them and stay for a while doing it, but many of the movements that have spread across America this morning have something very sinister behind it. It's, it's something more than just political. And it's something more than just moral. The Satan himself is behind a lot. And look, I'm telling you, we're prime set as a nation and as a country to fall into this kind of a time and, and, and to welcome it and to accept it. And it's becoming more and more so the further we go. So here's an army that spreads out upon the earth. And you'll notice the deadly campaign. Notice what's going to happen. A third. They were re released to kill a third 
of all mankind. Verse 18 says, By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone which came out of their mouths. An incredibly horrible time is coming on the earth. Now, that leads me to the third thought and the most important one in this message. Now, I want you to listen carefully. You know, a lot of times you'll read a passage like that and say, Ah, I don't know if that could be true or not. I tell you, you better believe it's true. Because here it is, right here in the Word of God. And, and God doesn't lie, ladies and gentlemen. And if you can conceive it, I believe it'll be even more horrible than what you could even conceive. But here's the point I want you to notice at the end of this message. And that's the third and final point, the fatal attitude. We see, we see the fallen angels. We see the fearful army. But I want you to notice the fatal attitude. You know, you would almost think that a group of people that were going through something like this, experiencing horrors like this, that it would just push them to their knees. They'd just want to repent. You'd almost think that, wouldn't you? But notice... The two verses I read for our scripture reading, verse 20 and 21, verse 20 says, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, what did they do? They did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Verse 21, and, and they did not repent. You know what I've seen? in my own personal time, right here in the good old USA. I've seen our nation go through struggles. I've seen us have catastrophes. I've seen us send men and women off to battle. And I've seen, you know, when, when we went off in desert storm, churches filled up to pray. Since then, I've seen less of that. Less of it when we have a little disaster. It's just like we get numbed. And that's exactly going to be the condition of people who live during this time. They're not going to repent. You know, notice two things about this attitude during this period of time. It's, it's, it's an attitude of hardness. You notice that? They did not repent. Their hearts were just hardened. And, and notice, they just... They, they worship demons. You, you notice that? Found that interesting in verse 20. They did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood. You know, one of the best-selling books in America, you probably wouldn't know it. I, I, I just stumbled across it in research. One of the, one of the best sellers sold millions and millions of co copies over the last several years is a satanic manual. More and more, this country and our world is becoming ripe and prime for a period of time exactly like this. See, the problem is we set this aside. And when you set this aside, you got nothing else to rest on. So it's any direction you want to go. It's anything you want to accept. It's anything that you want to follow. So there, there's a hardness. There's a non-repentance on the part of these people. But not only does it, there, is there this attitude of hardness, but horribleness. Notice, belief and behavior do go together. They do fit. In fact, what we do believe does affect how we behave. And if it doesn't, then something's wrong with your belief. And notice, the belief system that they have is in idols and demons and things that can't walk or hear or talk. And verse 21 shows you their, their actions. They didn't repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. All these things, and we could spend time on each and every one of them. They, they didn't repent of any of these things. Their murders. It'll be rampant during this period of time. But guess what? We're already set for that stage in America now, aren't we? Not a night goes by. Somebody's life isn't taken in a murder. In fact, my little phone has alerts. So-and-so number was shot in Montgomery. It's almost a regular occurrence. We have it all over the world. That's going to increase. 
and, and sorcerers. And that's an interesting word. We get the word, it, it's the word pharmakai. We get the word pharmacy from it. An indication of drugs and the use of drugs. And guess what we're doing in America? We're, we're legalizing it. We just started tiny, but, but you know what that does? That's the slippery slope that gets wider and wider and wider the further you go. See, everything is just setting itself up for this awful period of time. But notice, they did not repent. And here's the encouraging truth for today. Today, my counsel to people is, if you, if you have a, the slightest indication of remorse and repentance, you better do it. You better do it. You better not put it off. You better do it. And you know why? Because the time is going to come when you may not want to repent. You may not desire to repent. You may not desire to follow God and to hold His truth. What are we to do today? Thinking about a time like this coming upon the earth, i tell you what we're to do. We're to keep the faith. We're to hold to the truth. Keep the faith. Hold to the truth. Live for Jesus and share the gospel. Isn't that it? That's it. Keep the faith, hold to the truth, live for Jesus, and share the gospel. Because I want to tell you, punishment isn't what leads people to repentance. You know what my Bible says? Romans 2, 4 says, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And I want to tell you, if a person won't come to Jesus, listening to a preacher preach about the cross and the love of God, he isn't going to come to Jesus listening to a preacher preach about hell. Because it's not the punishment that leads people. It's realizing the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God. That God would take you and I, undeserving sinners as we are, love us enough to send His Son Jesus to the cross of Calvary. Brother, that ought to break your heart. Amen? Amen. And it ought to lead you to the cross. And not only that, it ought to motivate you enough to once you've come to Jesus, you then walk away to live for Jesus for the rest of your life. Would you bow together with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word today. I thank you, Lord, that it is a warning to us, a warning that a day is going to come when people won't even want to repent of their ungodly deeds. I thank you, Father, that today we still have the, that space of repentance. We still have that opportunity to repent. But Lord, I pray that people won't put that off. That if there are those who are listening to me or, or, or watching or here in this service this morning who need to repent of sin and come to you, who need to have their life restored by you, that Lord, they'll not put that off, but they'll come forward today giving their heart and life to you, repenting of their sin, turning their back on the ways of this world and following you in the ways of God. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn is 347. Hymn 347. I surrender all, I believe is that number. Would you, would you turn to that? Would you stand together with me this morning as we sing this great, great song of invitation? It gives us an opportunity to repent and to put our lives right with the Lord Jesus. Let's sing together this great song. If you'll come and stand with us, Tanya Shadburn. Uh, Peggy and I had the opportunity of visiting with her this week, and uh, her membership is at First Baptist Monroeville, and uh, she's been faithfully coming here at Olive Branch, and she wants to be a part of our church family and fellowship. Uh, those of you who welcome her and her decision today, we you let it be known by saying I? I? Amen. Look at that strong I right there, girl. I'll tell you what. Amen. That's great. I'm going to let her go back to the back and let our folks come by and express their, their prayer support for you, okay? Thank God bless you. All right. Good deal. We're thankful to have her. So blessed. Isn't God good? He just keeps adding to his church. And we're, we're so thankful for that. I hope you have a blessed day. Hope you enjoy this week. A good four. And just remember, invite folks next Sunday, Psalm 126, if you want to read it ahead of time, Snapshots of America in the message next Sunday. Let's bow together as we go to the Lord uh, in a word of prayer uh, together today. Father, I just want to thank you so much for the wonderful day, for this wonderful body of believers, for the love that is in this place. I just give you praise and thanks for it. 
Lord, I thank you for uh, giving us decisions and for people that continue to come into this fellowship to make it strong, to make it what you want it to be, to help us be that light in the world in which we live. Father, I'm so thankful today that we have a Savior who is sovereign, who is in control, who is guiding the events of all this world. And I thank you, Father, that I know you. I thank you that many in this room, if not all, know you and have trusted you as their Savior. If not, I pray you'll guide them to that decision. Because, Lord, that means what we're waiting for is that day when you come for us. We thank you for that promise. Help us to live each day faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.